I'm doing okay. No? Nope. Nope. I'll probably drink, grab a water here in a second.
right. Are we good to go? Are you ready to go? We are. Okay. Okay, everybody. We are getting ready for our next panel. So if you could all quiet down, we've got a, what's going to be an amazing conversation coming up. So we want to make sure we can all hear it. And we can shut the door too once we get our last. Yeah, if anyone questions. wants to continue their conversations, can you all go out? Thank you. Okay. All right. <laughs> so up next, we have a fireside chat with Commissioner Caroline D. Pham of the U.S. Commodity Futures Trading Commission, moderated by Sandra Rowe, CEO of GBBC. This conversation will explore the role of regulation in preparing for digital transformation. So please welcome Caroline and Sandra. Fantastic. Well, everyone, warm welcome for Commissioner Pham. Thank you for joining us today, especially at the United Nations Joint Staff Pension Funds offices. We are delighted to have you, and we've done this a few times before. We can take this on the road. Yeah, we could actually. <laughs> but I would love to have today's conversation really about the world is going digital. Everyone knows that. The world is also here in New York City this week because of the United Nations General Assembly and the focus is on SDGs. And then the question is, how do regulation, the role of the regulator and going digital and the SDGs, how do they actually um, converge? And I would love if we could start off with just talking about the role of the regulator is critical, but in your personal views and also just your journey, what observations have you made um, challenges for regulators and your own personal journey. Well, thank you so much for having me. I want to thank the Pension Fund for hosting this. I want to thank GBBC, Sandra Rowe, the entire team for putting together a great event. And I do enjoy our fireside chats. I think maybe we've done this in three or four cities now, so this is fantastic. What's interesting to me about the power of regulators to help to lead this transformation for good is based a lot on my observations when I was in the private sector. So when I was at Citigroup, among the many roles that I did is I served on Citi's Net Zero Sustainability Task Force. I did quite a lot of work with Citi's Chief Sustainability Officer and looked at a lot of the different policy goals around, for example, the green taxonomy in the EU, the initiatives in Asia, and then also implementing a climate risk management framework as required by many regulators around the world. And what I think is a unique opportunity now with what technology um, has the power to be an enabler is that if we can more appropriately think about technology from the beginning and how we can use it as a tool to achieve the SDGs to make the world a better place, to preserve the world for our children and for generations after. I think that's what's critical at this juncture. And I think that's why it's fantastic that we're having events like this, that there's NYC Climate Week to again, talk a lot about how these technologies can enable uh, SDGs. Absolutely. And um, I'm gonna ask you a hard question because you know we're here to ask the hard questions. How do regulators keep up with all of this? Because some of us who are actually in this space 24 seven have a hard time, and this is not your only mandate to think about digital or digital currencies. There's no question that it's gonna be challenging for regulators. So when we think about what is top of mind or the, the biggest priority for every regulator around the world in tackling these new technologies, and again, in the power of harnessing these technologies for a better tomorrow, is capacity building. I think uh, if you just look at the development of AI, um, generative AI, for example, in just one year, the latest models are so much more advanced than the first iteration. So how do regulators keep up with that? There has to be a concerted effort to take the resources that's necessary for capacity building and to upgrade, frankly, what are very legacy uh, systems that are not state of the art. The CFTC recently completed a cloud migration that should help us uh, be able to better utilize data analytics. But I've proposed in the past uh, that the CFTC ought to have $50 million set aside from our budget in order to invest in technology and in order to invest in capacity building amongst our uh, staff. So that could be doing things like creating our own AI Center for Excellence. Many other regulators around the world have done similar uh, initiatives, but I think it's also importantly in upgrading the technology systems 
and in bringing in, if necessary, external resources to help us with that transformation. Wow, everyone, did you hear that? Those who are live streamed, did you hear that? I think that's amazing. It's very rare for us to hear regulators saying that there needs to be dedicated significant money set aside for upgrading technology so that you could have better tools to do your job better. Thank you. And it's not an original idea of mine, by the way. The CFTC, during the time of Dodd-Frank, had $50 million set aside uh, in a technology uh, infrastructure fund for investment um, that was uh, championed by my former boss, Commissioner Scott O'Malia. And the thing is, is that the CFTC was never able to effectively deploy that $50 million. It was constantly being used for other expenses. And so I think it's, it's high time now that I'm back at the CFTC that we actually go and do that investment and uh, make sure that we are upgrading our systems to the latest surveillance capabilities, to uh, the potential for blockchain-based market infrastructure, uh, obviously for AI, for Gen AI. You know, for regulators, these new technologies aren't just challenges, they're also opportunities. We can become smarter, faster, stronger, better regulators, particularly when it comes to market oversight. And many of the people in this room are also the folks that you can interact with as industry uh, to also help with that. And you've been a big champion of public-private sector collaboration, um, particularly through your work with your GMAC and the Digital Asset Market Subcommittee. Uh, yes, shameless plug, but I think the committee's done, subcommittee's done a lot of great work. Um, would you mind speaking a bit about? Of course. So again, this is informed from my experience in the private sector, where I think oftentimes um, the private sector always has more resources than the public sector. They will always be the most up to date. They will always have the latest and greatest. You know, as soon as I started my role um, as a public official, I immediately felt uh, that the information I had was going stale. You know, every day I used to talk to 100 incredibly intelligent, brilliant, you know, colleagues, clients, partners, and uh, without a dedicated focus on making sure that we are keeping up with all of the latest and greatest, which we get from talking to the public, from talking to experts, um, you know, what will we do? So that's why I wanted to create uh, and relaunch the CFTC's Global Markets Advisory Committee. It was originally founded in 1998 to deal with the challenges around an increasingly globalized uh, world economy and markets. Those um, important uh, concerns from 1998 remain just as relevant today. So under the GMAX, um, the new priorities that I have set under my sponsorship, we have a digital asset market subcommittee. Again, just understanding how uh, blockchain-based networks can not only transform traditional market infrastructure for financial instruments for trading markets, but also more generally speaking, when you look at uh, how companies, how corporates are deploying it for digital engagement with customers, um, for efficiencies, for logistics, for record keeping, that's something that I think we really need to understand. So I wanna thank Sandra for her leadership. Um, we completed a first ever initiative to publish a US digital asset taxonomy. And this is supposed to be a working document that will help to inform uh, US policymakers. I really wanted to bridge a bit of a gap that I saw between the rest of the world where there's been a deep focus on blockchain-based market infrastructure um, versus the U.S. where we still are debating the, the <clears throat> fundamental nature, uh, good versus evil, of uh, crypto assets, for example. So I hope that this is going to be a document that can be informative, that can help to um, really educate and inform the specific different use cases, because it has to be use case driven. So thank you for your leadership. Thank you to GFMA, which also co-led yes, that. Absolutely. <laughs> She's been here. Um, so, so one other thing, now that we've got the Commissioner Fam fan club, um, I, I want to say one other thing, which is really critical, is the global discussion that's happening. And you've been a big champion of making sure that you're talking to other regulators. Can you just give us a sense of where are we with that? And you've mentioned AI a couple times now. We've mentioned it this morning multiple times. It's not just about one tech. It's multiple emerging technologies and then multiple jurisdictions. Um, would love if you could just give some insights around that. 
Yes, I've actually written on this before. I gave a speech um, actually at Eurofee to uh, European central bankers and policymakers because it is a global uh, challenge and we're going to need a global solution to it. So I'm going to reflect upon some of the remarks that I've given before. But when you think about the digital transformation, it is that our next life is going to be one where the lines between our physical and digital selves are blurred. You know, we can seamlessly switch from one to the next. It's going to be a layered existence, I think. Um, whether this is just by the increasing um, use of technology and day-to-day -day interactions, or whether it's virtual worlds, which is an area that I've been very um, focused on. So it's gonna create a new dimension for society and for community. Uh, one of the reasons why this is so important for regulators to take a forward-looking approach to be part of the solution, to build it in from the very beginning, is because the early impacted sectors include consumer and retail, media and telecommunications, and healthcare. And when you think about the high potential customer use cases, they include e-commerce, and then enterprise use cases are banking, discrete manufacturing, professional services, retail, telecommunications, media, process manufacturing. You can see how broadly this impacts the real economy. It is so far beyond the financial sector. And so we as financial regulators are going to just be one part of something which I think needs to be through initiatives like the United Nations, but every country is going to be addressing this through their industrial policy. So we have to bring all those countries together to develop a common shared vision for an ethical, safe, and inclusive digital economy and a world where we can make sure that that happens. And so some of the different um, areas in order to really make sure that that happens is going to be you know, data privacy, security, ethics and regulatory compliance, physical health and safety, and equity and fairness. I don't think I'm saying anything that's new. People have talked about this, there's initiatives for this, but it just goes to show the breadth of what we need to do. I mean, I think some priority areas, again, technology, commercial infrastructure, privacy and identity, workforce of the future, regulation, tax, accounting, and social infrastructure, more, open access, competition and promoting innovation, intellectual property rights, commerce, monetization and distribution models between stakeholders, promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion, and securing user safety and awareness. So it is so much bigger than any one regulator. That's why there has to be a global approach to this. And I'll have to say, wow, you managed to get a lot in there. I think we actually covered a good number of those topics today alone, and a lot of them map to the SDGs. And frankly, I think most of them map to the SDGs, which is why I think it's critical here. We've been talking a lot about human-centric tech, people-centric tech, um, and I think you know that resonates with you too. If, it does, if it's not helping communities and people, um, the technology itself, okay, might be nice, but what's the utility value of that? And I think broadening the scope of that discussion, which you've done just now as well as you continue to do, is very important. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's why it's so imperative that regulators uh, and the global community, um, there are many multilateral forums for regulators. There's the Financial Stability Board, there's IOSCO, there's the Basel Committee. Those are going to be increasingly important, again, because of the fact that this is a technology without borders. And we have seen what happens when you try to retrofit those protections in. So for example, with the EU's uh, DORA, and the US is, is looking at trying to come up with its own approach to that as well. And the thing is, is that why are we reinventing the wheel? These are common issues. So it's gonna be necessary for regulators to be able to anticipate and adapt to the issues quickly. A principles-based framework is what the CFTC has, that's why I think that's the best. But regulators, again, have to proactively engage with the private sector because we need to ensure that there's responsible development of products and services that have the protections built in from the beginning. Thank you so much for that. And um, I think, you know, you have seen and been driving a lot of the global dialogue. Um, if, if I may ask, if you could put it on a scale of just the, the maturity level, do you feel that the regulatory dialogue over the last few years has actually stepped up to recognizing the multi-dimensional, the multifaceted complexity of what's happening? Absolutely. I think this has been top of mind for many research reports, for example, that the BIS has published. So there's no question that regulators recognize these challenges and recognize that we need to work on it. But as always, the challenge for regulators is resources. Again, it's not a world of infinite resources. That's why I think the private-public partnerships are going to be necessary. And national security, I think, provides a very good example 
for how to succeed in that. We have many different multilateral uh, forums and initiatives for national security. The U.S. State Department is heavily involved in promoting uh, some of the cybersecurity initiatives that we have around the world. And so only by taking a combined approach to addressing these problems. For example, I'm thinking of ransomware. There was an initiative a couple years ago to really come together private uh, and public sector to focus on ransomware and the potential for ransomware attacks to shut down critical infrastructure, mm -hmm. the power grid, water, hospital systems. These really happened and countries had to come together to solve that. So I, I really look to the leadership that I think uh, in the national security apparatus. Great, and, and we do only have a few more minutes with you. Um, when you look to uh, where we are uh, with respect to um, tokenization and digital in the US, private sector really is still innovating. And I think it continues to thrive. We've got a lot of the right ingredients for that. How do we help other countries, other places where that the same set of ingredients are not there for um, entrepreneurs to find capital and things like that. Is there a role for regulators to actually play? You know, is it helping other regulators in other jurisdictions who may not have the same sets of tools and resources? I actually think it's other jurisdictions and regulators that have been more successful in mm -hmm. unlocking and studying and understanding the potential for blockchain-based networks, whether it's for financial market infrastructures, we've talked a lot today, or for other use cases, because those countries uh, did not win the race on the internet. That was the United States. And look at what it's done to supercharge the U.S. economy. And so I do think that other countries see this as an opportunity that they don't want to miss. They don't want to come in on the tail end of this. Plus, they're concerned, again, national security, that they need to have their own technology, their own national champion. So what I think has been very successful is not only the regulatory sandboxes that other jurisdictions have created with the participation of their central banks, the prudential authority, and the markets regulator or conduct authority, but also they're actually providing funding. So again, the United States has the greatest capital markets in the world because the best and brightest come here for our universities, and then they stay for the cheap funding, cheap and plentiful funding that we have available for people to do startups. Mm -hmm. So in other countries, they're finding ways to deploy capital uh, through grants mm -hmm. and other government initiatives. In our last few minutes, I will um, ask you to touch more upon your personal um, experience. As a regulator, how have you had to change your priorities or maybe the calculus of how you look at things knowing where digital is going now versus what you might have thought a couple years ago. Has anything really changed or do you still think you're still prioritizing the same sets of um, issues? You know, for the for markets, for the financial markets in particular, it's always an area of uh, innovation, of new technology, of faster, stronger, better. So if you look at the electronification of markets, for example, I mean, that's something that started in the 80s, probably, and it still continues to this day across, you know, more and more asset classes, particularly asset classes that are less liquid. Um, and what innovation and technology have unlocked in financial markets is, again, uh, access to new markets and new products. And so that's why it's been a focus of mine. So in that respect, it's not changed. I still think that regulators need to be focused on ensuring market integrity for new markets and new products and ensuring access to markets. Yeah. I think what this technology is really, really underscored though, and again, I can't emphasize this enough, is that we regulators need to upgrade our capacity, <laughs> our capabilities and our capacity building. So that's the number one priority. We have to start yesterday on the technology uh, upgrade and, and on the people's um, uh, experience and capabilities for it as well. I couldn't agree with you more that this technology has the ability to help regulators and everyone in law enforcement as opposed to the tired conversation that is just for nefarious purposes. Mm -hmm. And so I appreciate you underscoring that this technology can really be utilized in a very positive way. Well, in AI, for example, uh, particularly Gen AI, it amplifies uh, human capabilities. So, for example, you can take uh, an exam report, a supervisory exam report. You can have that first draft be done with Gen AI. Again, humans deploying it. This is not machines, robots taking over the world. But you can input all of the field work and the working papers, and you can come up with a first draft report. You can um, upload 
uh, a firm's entire past compliance reports into it and develop insights over um, time and use that to inform a risk-based approach to supervision. So again, these are very easily manageable, low-hanging fruit for regulators to be able to harness the technology to make ourselves uh, more productive, to be able to close that resource gap that we have. That's a great and fitting end to the discussion. I think you are absolutely right. There's tons of low-hanging fruit, especially in Gen AI, for regulators to adopt. And frankly, let's encourage all of our regulators to do so. Thank you, Commissioner Pham. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much. So interesting. Thank you.